All right, coming up in the next uh, segment, we're going to be talking to Simon Roche. He is the head of the Office of the HQ, the world's largest non-state civil defense organization. He's trying to defend people that the government of South Africa has targeted for extinction. That's right, genocide. And they are the ultimate preppers. They're banding together to protect their lives, not just their property. As the government says, they're going to take both. And they brag about it. So stay with us. We're going to be talking to him right after the break. There's something going on in South Africa that's not talked about frequently in the U.S. It's not politically correct to talk about black racism against white people. It's not politically correct to talk about the genocide of white people by a black majority government. But that's what's going on in South Africa. Racism is racism and genocide is genocide. And we're going to talk about it whether it's politically correct or not, because I don't really care about the skin colors of the people who are doing the wrong thing. Genocide is wrong. Racism is wrong. We're going to be talking to Simon Roche. He is the head of the office of the HQ. Now, this is interesting because uh, this is a group that's come together. It's a non-state group. It is a civil defense organization. And I'm going to let him lay out for you the dire straits that they're in and the fact that they have the uh, president of the country right now, Jacob Zuma, is essentially calling on people and singing songs that say, you know, kill the white farmers, take their land. Uh, they're proving this. They're saying they're not going to prosecute anybody that kills white people. And we have seen reports of amazing brutality, stuff that you typically see in the drug wars in Mexico. But it is racially motivated. It is motivated by people who are also communists, part of the ANC. And according to his biography here, it says that Simon Roche was once an ANC activist. So I want to ask him about that. Of course, that's the party of Nelson Mandela. It is the party of Jacob Zuma right now. He is no longer a part of that. You can find him on sudlanders.org, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Simon. Uh, it's S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S. It actually means Southlanders. And uh, he is Afrikan. So uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Roche. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Mr. Knight. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on there. Lay out uh, where the Afrikaans came from. They've been there as long as we've had uh, people here in the United States uh, uh, who came here to uh, settle from Europe. I'm not talking about Christopher Columbus, but I'm talking about the settlers that we had who came over in the 1600s uh, from uh, England who settled in uh, Plymouth Rock, the early 1600s and so forth. Uh, that's about the time that uh, people from other parts of Europe, uh, people, the Huguenots and the uh, Calvinists who had fled uh, religious persecution, uh, they went to South Africa and they've been there about 400 years, right? Yeah, that's correct. They established the first settlement on the 6th of April, 1652, and um, they were comprised primarily of three religious groups. That is to say that the Dutch at the time were very famous for their uh, pious Calvinism. They were joined by French people who were who went there as Huguenots, not as French, and mm -hmm. subsequently by uh, German Lutheran soldiers demobilized after the Thirty Years' War, or a knock-on effect of that. And uh, so it, it's a it's a culture that is steeped in Africa. It's a gene pool that is amalgamated to form one of the the strongest gene pools in the world, very famously so, as some Indian scientists revealed uh, uh, not so long ago. Uh, so there's a lot of integrity to the people, the culture, the tradition, the language, and the religion, a very authentic group of people. Now, what happened, and of course everybody in the United States, they paid a great deal of attention uh, when there was apartheid. After that ended, uh, basically Americans haven't paid any attention uh, for the last, uh, I guess, when did that end? That was uh, early 90s, was that? 1994. Uh, when that ended? 1994, yeah. okay. So for the last uh, uh, 20 or so years, uh, nobody's really paid much attention to that here in the United States. But now the guy who shared a Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela, uh, F.W. de Klerk, and that'll be a familiar name to uh, those of us who are watching it under apartheid, um, he set up an agreement with Nelson Mandela. Uh, they transitioned from an apartheid, uh, which was a rigid segregation of the different races, to a rainbow nation democracy, they said. Now he has come out, and he has said that President Zuma is determined to accelerate our descent along the road to state capture, economic crisis, and racial confrontation. That's uh, F.W.D. Clerk, uh, again, the 
a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, along with Nelson Mandela, for ending apartheid. Uh, he accused the ruling establishment of being openly hostile to white people based on negative racial stereotypes. Let's talk about uh, what the form of that open hostility has taken in South Africa against white farmers. Well, you know, there, there's a broad array of uh, what are known as broad-based black economic empowerment laws. In other words, affirmative action laws. And those affirmative action laws have created a scenario in which it's not in the interests of a commercial entity to have white employees, or it is in their interest to have as few as possible. And I think that that was perhaps the beginning of the, the scenario that you've just described. Uh, for many white people, it was their first experience of being sort of excluded from uh, realizing their full potential within the South African body politic. Um, the, the laws specifically encourage employers to have more people of certain colors uh, if they want to get contracts with the government. And in any modern economy uh, anywhere in the world, uh, the, the state, the government, is the largest purchaser of goods and services. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can imagine the immediate ramifications of that. And that was coupled with a drastic increase in crime that uh, led to uh, our Minister of Police uh, stating in the year 2007 that if white people in Parliament, if white people don't like the levels of crime in South Africa, they should leave. And I think that it was at that point that many white people in South Africa began to realize that much of the rhetoric of the African National Congress in the 90s, early 90s, prior to assuming power on the 27th of April 1994, and subsequently, and their acolytes, the, 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 the liberals and the academic elites and others who always said that the African National Congress was a benevolent force uh, that could do no wrong, really, uh, was a load of nonsense. It, it became apparent around about then. Subsequently, the police determined not to release crime statistics based on the, the, the actual crime, in other words, you can read about um, uh, violent crimes, but it's difficult to get statistics on farm murders, for example. And similarly, not to release statistics based on race. Now, any of you who's watching this can think for themselves what the implications of that are. It means that it's almost impossible for anybody to construct an, a, a truthful narrative about the severity of what's happening in South Africa. This sort of Marxist manipulation or control of, of uh, information has led to a scenario where uh, we, as Saitlanders, the world's largest non-state civil defense organization, have had to work with other people to compile our own statistics, always conservatively, always cautiously, so that we don't get caught out. And the results, which we've produced in collaboration with uh, some people in the United States of America, highly reliable statistical factual results, are frightening. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world today, uh, Mr. Knight. And, and of course, we have seen this type of thing happening with the globalists uh, who are trying to suppress crime by uh, refugees or by illegal immigrants who come into Europe and other places. They refuse to identify them uh, by the ethnic group so that people don't get concerned about uh, Islamic uh, jihad in uh, Europe. Yes. So that's not uncommon to what we're seeing here. And as you pointed out, this started with a policy of affirmative action, even though uh, the black people were in the majority. Uh, they were setting up an affirmative action for black people, presumably because it was an economic disparity. That was what justified it. But now we're at the point now yes. where there is a great deal of violence. And we're going to give you, and there's a little bit of time that we've got here, because we've got to take a break, and then we're going to come back to you, uh, Simon. Uh, but here's one example. Uh, a woman who is a British national, she is a former pharmaceutical executive. She and her husband, who is 66 years old, confronted by a group of masked men, they were tortured. Uh, she had uh, a blowtorch was used on them for several hours. She suffered horrific burns to her breasts. They attempted to kill her by stuffing a plastic bag down her throat, driving them down to a roadside where they shot her and her husband, shot her in the head. Uh, she still survived for some time before she died, shot her husband in the neck. But of course, they can't tell you that this was something that was done that was racially motivated, and they're not going to come after the killers. We'll be right back. 
Perhaps the most dangerous occupation in the world, being a farmer in Marxist South Africa, especially being a white farmer in Marxist South Africa. We're talking to Simon Roche. He is uh, head of the office of HQ. We're going to talk to him about the prepper issues there. We've been laying out the case for why white people in South Africa under the Marxist racist government there, the ANC, uh, they are now targeted for murder, targeted for extinction. It is a policy of racism and genocide. As this uh, Breitbart article that I have here that uh, just came out three days ago, epidemic of South African farm murders continues as gunmen shoot an elderly victim dead. That's another murder uh, beside the one that I just uh, told you about, about the uh, elderly lady and her husband who were uh, shot. Uh, they were tortured with blow torches. Uh, she died from her ordeal. But here's some of the statistics, because Mr. Roche was telling us that the government has suppressed any information about the ethnicity of the people who are killed. They have suppressed information about whether these attacks are taking place on farms. So they've been compiling this information themselves. They can say they know that at least 1,187 farmers, 490 family members, 147 farm employees, 24 farm visitors have known to be murdered in the last uh, 18 years, although they believe the true figure is between 3,000 and 4,000. The average murder ratio per 100,000 for the population in general in the world is 9. In South Africa, it is 54, a very violent country. But for the farming community, it is 138. 138. That's why I say it is the most dangerous occupation anywhere in the world. And, of course, the response of the government is what is interesting in this. The president uh, who is there now, President Zuma, has defended the singing of the revolutionary song, Kill the Farmer, Kill the Boer. And they're talking about the white South African uh, Boers, the Afrikaans. Uh, one of his MPs was crying out, bury them alive during a recent parliamentary debate. So in the backdrop of all this, Mr. Roche, uh, some of you have put together your own organization. Uh, if you want to tell us a little bit more about the political climate, uh, go ahead. But I also want to talk to you about what you are doing to privately prepare. Because here in the United States, we have preppers, and uh, we're worried about a lot of different scenarios. We're worried about natural disasters and EMP pulse, uh, different things like that, or societal breakdown. But you are experiencing it right now. You've got the president of your country uh, saying uh, that he wants to kill the farmers, uh, kill the white people, and not prosecute those who do it. He's encouraging it. So what do you do to prepare for that? Well, he, he's encouraging it. And on top of that, uh, twice, three times last year, three very senior black leaders said that a, a race-based civil war in South Africa is inevitable. Famously, on the 7th of November in the town of Newcastle in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, Julius Malema, the head of the political party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, stated, I am not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. A few days later, a senior traditional leader, whose name I unfortunately cannot mention uh, publicly, said to me, Simon, in your culture, in, in English idiom, that could mean many things. In African idiom, that means one thing. Now, this guy is speaking as the king of an entire nation within our country. He said to me, in African idiom, that means one thing. I'm going to call upon you to kill these people. Prepare for it. On top of that, we uh, our sovereign bond rating has been revised to junk. I'm sure many people don't know that. You know, South Africa, supposedly the darling of the world, the wonderful uh, new South African rainbow nation experiment as it is, you would think that this stuff would be on the front page of every newspaper all of the time. And I think that what's very important for your viewers to recognize here is that the mainstream media in the world, the global capital-driven media, has not reported to this thing. Now, it can't be by accident if you consider the profile of the country and the egregious severity of these events and these statistics. So clearly it's deliberate. And we assume that the reason why they're not reporting this is because they wish to avoid the humiliation of tacitly admitting that they were wrong for the 40 or 50 or 30 year period that they shoved down the throats of the Western world, this consistent narrative of apartheid is bad and the poor black people and this and that, and if we only get Nelson Mandela in power, it'll be an absolute utopia. 
And of course, it hasn't been the case at all. This is not an apology for apartheid. It's, it's a statement of how things are. Now, well, of course, Nelson Mandela was a Marxist, and in all the uh, all the hagiographies that were done when he died uh, here in the Western press, uh, the inescapable fact was that he was a Marxist. And when we look at President well, Zuma, one of the other things in the uh, Breitbart article. Uh, that just came out uh, four days ago. They said uh, in South, they called. He's called for South Africa's constitution to be amended so that farmland can be seized without compensation. That's not surprising coming from a Marxist party. That's exactly the type of thing that they would do. But they've taken it another step further to say that uh, if you are a white person, you are an enemy of the Marxists. Therefore, you are targeted for extinction. That was also not really a surprise for many of us who saw the Marxist roots of uh, Nelson Mandela. And they say, um, and this is a rallying cry, as it's reported here, people of South Africa, where you see beautiful land, take it. It belongs to you. And then saying that they will not prosecute people who uh, kill others in neighboring Zimbabwe. And we've seen Zimbabwe uh, collapse. It's become a textbook case of hyperinflation as their currency went to absolute zero. So we have these areas uh, that were turned over to black majority rule and uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and then in South Africa. And we've seen the rapid economic uh, decline of these areas. But it's largely because these are A, dictators, and B, they are Marxist dictators. But they are focusing on uh, taking the land and taking the lives of the uh, white people who are farming the land, who have been there as long as we've had... Uh, European settlers building settlements here, coming here, escaping religious persecution as we begin the program. That was the same reason that the Afrikaans uh, went to South Africa, was to escape religious persecution. They saw that as their land. Uh, Russell Means has often talked about, hey, don't talk about Native Americans. Talk about American Indians, because he said people have been here for 400 years. They're Native Americans. Uh, you're Native uh, African. That's why you call yourself uh, Afrikaans. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, where you see this headed. Well, we, we see it headed in a in a very, very bad direction. It's almost like the trajectory of a of a ball being thrown by a, a boy who's been warned by his mother not to break uh, a window while playing with the ball. And, you know, he sort of slips and, and the ball flies skew his little baseball. And, and in a sort of a millionth of a second, he knows what the trajectory of that ball is going to be. And he knows full well that it's going to hit the window. We're in that scenario in South Africa now. The trajectory is very, very clear. And it has been consistent over 23 years since the 27th of April, 1994, when the African National Congress under Nelson Mandela, who remained a member of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party to his dying day, until now. We've had all of these consistent declines. Our economy is on its knees. General Motors has just announced that it's completely divesting from South Africa. Uh, Moody's has announced that it is shutting down its South Africa office. A very important German bank is withdrawing. Uh, three of South Africa's m most important, biggest companies have taken their listings from South Africa. These are hundreds, hundreds, hundreds years old South African companies have taken their listings from South Africa to London and other places. So the, the simple reality is that we are in a, in a terrible trajectory which is heading for a crisis. And as we've been warned repeatedly in recent months, particularly over the past year, um, we are headed for a race-based civil war. This is what black leaders are doing. So our organization, State Lunders, which is the world's hey, largest... Hang on a second, because I want you... Can you stay another uh, five minutes with us uh, on the other side of the break? Because we've got a break coming up in about a minute and a half. Yes, certainly. Okay, good. Uh, before we get to the prep, and we'll do the prep when we come back in the next segment, I want to ask you about something I find curious in your uh, biography here. It says that you were once an ANC activist. Tell us about that. Tell us how you went from an ANC activist to uh, opposing uh, the Marxists that are there. I was a young white boy who believed that it was good for everybody to have a place in the sun. I believed that it was right for we as white people to concede power to the majority, to democracy, so that every human being would be equal under the law and would have an equal opportunity. Uh, over time, I began to see that a lot of the narrative of the African National Congress and the narrative of uh, freedom, let's say, the liberation of Africa was absolute nonsense. I worked 
quite closely with the African National Congress on a number of projects and indeed with the government as, as a separate entity. We speak of the party and the government separately. And, uh, All right, Simon, we've got to take a break, so, but that's, that says it exactly. You know, that's how they get in power, but the Marxists don't play by the rules of freedom and equality. They do whatever it takes to get power, and once they get power, we see the violence and the oppression that comes with it. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk to Simon about how they are preparing to defend themselves. We'll be right back. When he was young, he believed in freedom and equality. He opposed apartheid. He even joined the African National Congress. But Marxists don't play by those rules. They don't play by those principles. They use the ideas of freedom and equality to get power. But once they get power, then they are now in South Africa following a policy of genocide against white farmers. And so we want to talk to Simon Roche. And again, the organization is Sudlanders, S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S dot org. And they are now banding together. Now Simon Roche, as his biography says here, is working tirelessly to prepare for impending catastrophe. We've talked about the ongoing murders of white farmers in South Africa, the fact that the Marxist president is encouraging it, encouraging the taking of their land, encouraging the taking of their lives. They have now joined together in the world's largest non-state civil defense organization. So I want to get him to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, if you don't know about the problem and you want to know more about that, you can go to their website. You can also find a few articles in Western media. Most of this is, of course, covered up because it is not politically correct to talk about this kind of oppression. Uh, we want to pretend that uh, there's no problems now that uh, Nelson Mandela has been put in office and apartheid has ended. But they have a different kind of apartheid now. And they have a race war that is being uh, promoted by the current president, Zuma. Uh, Simon, tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you guys are doing there to prepare for your own self-defense since the government is out to get you. What can you do? Our organization was founded about 20 years ago, and through the first uh, few years, it uh, went through an evolutionary process to what it is today. And for about the past 16, 17 years, we've been in our current form, which is a, a civil defense organization constituted under the specific provisions of the protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions, which make provision for identifiable ethnic groups to prepare to protect themselves as civilian non-combatants, this is vital that people should know this, we're not uh, rabid uh, militants, uh, as civilian non-combatants uh, in the event of an armed conflict, whether it be international or local in nature, non-international. As such, we, with our, uh, the largest membership uh, of any such organization in the world, have a nationwide emergency plan which is devoted to withdrawing our people from uh, built up areas and consolidating them in remote rural regions where we can provide uh, protection uh, within the provisions of international law, where we can ensure that the women and children and the, uh, the um, uh, dis uh, disabled or, or uh, uh, people who are not able bodied uh, can be looked after as well as possible. That is the gist of the plan. It, it comprises a security component, a massive nationwide grid of communications uh, systems and uh, logistics, the provision of water and food and fuel, uh, uh, warmth and shelter, and so on and so forth. Uh, to, 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 we anticipate something like 800,000 to a million people in the event of this crisis that the black leaders are promising uh, wow. Uh, occurring. Wow. And so you have a very clear and present danger. It's not like American preppers who are trying to provide for a wide variety of scenarios. And of course, we have Joel Skousen and his strategic location, making sure that you've got a place to bug out to. We've got James Wesley Rawls, uh, who talks about his survival blog. Uh, the fact that you've got to connect with other people. You've got to have a plan that involves other people. So if people yes. want to know not only what's going on in South Africa, but they also want to know what they can do to prepare, 
uh, from people who have been under the gun for quite some time, they can go to your website. Again, that is sudlenders.org, S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S.org. And I assume that you've also got some information there about the current political crisis as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Simon, and best luck to you. I know you have a very difficult road ahead of you. We'll be right back with more news. I'm David Knight.